in our show one of the series, it's the early days, it's the uh, first hear rock and roll. When did you first begin to understand that there was something out there? What did it mean to you? It meant a great deal. Uh, music saved my life. In England at the time, in the north of England, the uh, thing to do was to do what your father did, and what his father did, and what his father did. Work until you're about 65, lie down, get a gold watch, and die. And that was about it, you know. I never went for that. I never fell for that, uh, that dream. And my parents allowed me not to follow that dream. And I, I often wondered why, when I was a teenager at 13 years old, listening to rock and roll on Radio Luxembourg in England, listening to the American Top 40 through... Uh, the, the radio was in the living room. And, of course, when I went to bed, there was no way that I was going to go to bed and miss the American Top 40 show. So I would listen to the radio through my bedpost. And uh, it conducted quite well, actually. And uh, it was amazing how much sound really traveled through the floor and through my bedpost into my head. At 13, when I had a, um, my first metaphysical choice in life, which was uh, a birthday present that could have either been a guitar or a bicycle, except that my mother very gently told me that they couldn't afford a bicycle. So, you know, but for choices, I might have uh, won the Tour de France. But uh, I didn't. I, I chose a guitar, learned to play guitar, learned to sing with my friend Alan Clark, was influenced by early American rock and roll, by the Everly Brothers in the mid-50s, by Presley, by Gene Vincent, by Buddy Holly, by Jerry Lee Lewis, by Fats Domino, by the Platters. Did not want to listen to Bobby V, did not want to listen to Fabian, did not want to listen to, uh, uh, you know, Annette and uh, Frankie. At the same time, right after that, after, uh, after World War II, American sailors used to come into ports in the north of England and bring with them R&B records, especially into Liverpool and Manchester, being at both ends of the Manchester Ship Canal, which was the lifeline to the north. And so you'd be able to hear bands doing uh, stuff by Barrett Strong, stuff by Benny Spellman, by the early drifters and the early coasters. So rock and roll, uh, certainly American rock and roll, played a very important part in my life. What was the message, Graham? I mean, you, you say it played an important part in your life, but what, as a kid, what was the message you were hearing? Was there a message or was it just... Oh, there was absolutely a message, absolutely. Uh, and the message was to become popular and uh, to be attractive to ladies and to, uh, to play out those sexual role models, you know? That was the message. And uh, it worked surprisingly well. Um, in America at that time, people were grabbing onto, kids were grabbing onto that music. I think because of the sexual message, but I also think because there was a lot of rebellion in sure. that music. Sure, absolutely. Now, you talk to me about that rebellion and how it, how you it manifested itself for you. I know you didn't fight with your parents on that score, the way that American kids were fighting with No, them. but there, there was a lot of fighting to be done. When you were uh, influenced by rock and roll, when you wanted to go out to dances, when you wanted to meet the opposite sex, when you wanted to shake your body and, and to drink a little and to, uh, you know, smoke for the first time. I mean, one cigarette, I was gone. I never smoked again in my life. It just wasn't for me. But, you know, when you start to get into those kind of things, when you start to stay out late, when you start to want to hang out with your friends more, it does create friction in society. Now, I didn't have that particular friction with my parents, but many of my friends did. They uh, get a real job, son. This rock and roll business will never last. This was 57. You know, never last, never last. So there was a lot of rebellion going on. And then what happened is... Uh, when I first came to America in, in the mid-60s, I saw a place that had tremendous freedom and yet not. I saw vast doors of opportunity open, which you could walk through, and with an idea and some hard work, you could pull off your dream here in America. When I first came, I didn't want to go back to England. I felt spiritually that this place was my home. 
And in 1968, I, I moved here permanently and have never lived in England since. But in those early days, I saw a place where you could breathe, where you, uh, spiritually and physically, where you could, if you wanted, say, for instance, uh, a cowbell at 3 o'clock in the morning, you, you could pick up this phone that rang just like it did in the movies, and you could call, and someone 10 minutes later would deliver you a cowbell. Now, in England, we were brought up slightly differently in rock and roll. We were told and believed for many years that the echo machine went off at 10.30. And so all our sessions never went beyond 10.30. Only years later did I realize that that's when the pubs shut. And it had nothing to do with echo machines, but it had to do with control, right? So I went from that kind of an environment to an environment where everybody wanted to hear ideas, everybody was open for ideas, and everybody would let you express your ideas. So that kind of freedom really knocked me uh, out. I, I really thrived under that kind of, uh, of an environment. When you were a kid, 1957, 56, and you looked at America, what did you see? I saw what every other kid saw. I saw I Love Lucy. Okay, I saw, so I, I just start me off again when I was a kid. Okay. When I was a kid, the only real contact with American culture came via movies and early records and early television. So it was I Love Lucy, it was Jackie Gleason, it was, you know, John Wayne, it was Audie Murphy, it was Cowboys and Indians, it was war movies, and that basically was my only true impression of America because I'd never been here. I didn't read American newspapers, I didn't watch uh, American news programs. Uh, and it wasn't until later that I began to realize that this place that I thought was so free had this dark side to it. It was only, it only seemed to be free for uh, the majority of white people and the majority of bright people. And I began to realize that not all was well in this land of, uh, of, of plenty. That there were people starving to death, there were people discriminated against, there were decisions made on behalf of, uh, of the public by the administrations that were totally not what the public wanted. The Vietnam War, of course, was a, was a great example of that. And uh, early on in my career with David and Stephen, we did a lot of anti-Vietnam War benefits. And when you saw the Vietnam War on the news, night after night after night, at 6 o'clock, just when you were supposed to be sitting down eating your dinner, you saw uh, burning bodies, body counts, uh, total warfare on the 6 o'clock evening news with Walter's face right in front of it. There, were, there came a time when you could not deny that what was going on there in, in, in Vietnam was wrong, was futile, was uh, a crime. And I think that probably the American people were educated by the television programs, especially the news programs, to put pressure on the administration, their congressmen, their senators, and their presidents to bring an end to that war. And I realized that the American, American television was an incredibly powerful tool that could be used to sway public interest and to push people down roads that they may not necessarily want to go. Because as well as educating people, it really did indoctrinate them into thinking that the Vietnam War was good in the early days. You know, that we were going over there to kill a commie for Christ and it was all great and we're going to keep our shores safe from communism. We're and it turned out to be a lie. I'm going to talk about that. That's a, that's okay. a, a, show, a later show comment. I want to get into some of that. But I want to ask you, before we get too far away from that early, the early days, um, in the message in, in any of the music you heard coming through the airwaves, what was that message telling you? When I was a kid listening to this, me this, this music from, from America, what were you hearing? I was hearing, when I was a kid, a message of the grass is always greener on the other side, and I couldn't wait to go and play in that field of grass. There were no messages, per se, as later uh, arrived in, in popular music. But the underlying message was one of uh, trying to explain romances between boy and girls, trying to talk about street life, 
trying to talk about uh, trying to find happiness. It was very li there was very little doom and uh, gloom in those early records. How about Elvis? Did Elvis mean anything to you? Absolutely. Tell, tell me. I had a friend once, and uh, as I mentioned earlier about the, um, this friend of mine chose to get a bicycle and so did, in fact, drive, ride on his bicycle all the way from England to Bad Nauheim in Germany, where Elvis was stationed. But earlier than that, uh, how could you not be influenced by that voice and that, those rhythms and those recordings? They were utterly fantastic. Uh, even so, that today, well, a couple of years ago, I went to Memphis, specifically go to the Sun Studios, and feel and be in the presence of that small, tiny room where all that tremendous music went on. And I sought out Sam Phillips, and I uh, asked to, uh, to see the actual recording board where all that music poured through. And so, yes, Presley's music was very influential on many uh, rock and roll uh, people in England. Sure, yeah. As we move, as we move along into our, into what is our, like our show three concept of, of uh, the youth culture, the hippie movement, uh, counterculture, whatever you want to call it. There's a, a lot of people mark the time beginning when the time the Beatles arrived in, in America. Somehow that was a, a magic moment. Indeed. Uh, yeah, I, I, and I'm, I don't know that if I, to, I, if I totally buy it, because I don't know whether, whether that counterculture movement's a political movement or it's a cultural movement, I'm not sure. But um, as a, young, as a young person, I guess you were involved in music by this time. What did, what did the Beatles mean? What did they mean over there? There was something very interesting going on in music when I was a kid. And it was um, very similar to, uh, I could put it in racial terms almost. You draw a line uh, from just south of Birmingham in the Midlands, and everybody above that were peasants, and everybody below that that spoke the Queen's English or the King's English. Uh, were the well-to-do, influential people. When the Beatles came along in the early 60s and became very popular and became very cult-like amongst the kids, all of a sudden, all the people uh, south of that line began to realize that uh, their hold on society was slipping, that there was something going on above that line that should be checked out. I mean, there were even people that were imitating Liverpool accents down there. You know, so the Beatles were incredibly uh, important in breaking down that I imaginary line that was, that was drawn just south of Birmingham. And they did other things, too. They opened uh, a door for a tremendous amount of people, uh, young kids, to get into music because they could make it. Now then, uh, I first saw the Beatles in 1958, 59 at a talent show in, in Manchester when there were only three of them. And they were called Johnny and the Moondogs, I think. And they did a Buddy, Buddy Holly song called Think It Over. And uh, it was quite a moment because when they would walk into a ballroom in their uh, leather coats a couple of years later, 61, 62, and their haircuts, having just come back from uh, Hamburg, girls would fall down, literally. You could sense it was like four James Deans walked in. You know, you knew that something was going on. They hadn't opened their mouths yet. They hadn't sung a note, you know. But we played many, many shows with them in the north of England. And it was always fascinating to watch girls' reaction to the Beatles. Uh, they moved down to London. Uh, acid came along. Uh, marijuana came along. Hashish came along. Everything started to flower. Colors started to sprout. Clothes got looser, more colorful, more abstract, more bizarre. Uh, Carnaby Street happened. And the whole of the youth culture exploded, flowered, really, literally. And then when uh, the Beatles came to America, right after, you know, I mean, you were, you know, America was still coming out of the Kennedy assassinations, was coming out of... Uh, uh, Johnson and the Vietnam War, uh, you know, situation. And they really needed something to latch on to, some hope to grasp a hold of. And 
the youth of America found that hope in the Beatles. That, that's fascinating. But let's talk about that message for a second. Um, you were playing with the Hollies at this time? Yes. Okay. Did you people think that you had um, a message in your music? Were you making political statements? What was the music about? The music about uh, that time was well-constructed pop songs. A cross between R&B and um, Frankie Avalon. Good melodies, easily identifiable. Shallow words, ideally around 2 minutes 50 seconds. I looked at some of the Hollage recordings uh, the other day and I was amazed to find how many records were at 250. It was almost like, you know, that was instilled in you, that was drilled into you, that that was the perfect single length, you know. So later, uh, having uh, ingested many drugs, I began to realize, after my first visit to America, that uh, music had a deeper meaning and a deeper purpose than the shallow three-minute pop song. I began to change the way I thought. I began to change the way I look at things. I began to change my writing. I began to talk about things that uh, I thought were more important, and that music was not some way of becoming popular and making money, but had a direct responsibility to talk and speak the truth as I saw it. So uh, I then meet David and Stephen, who are people that think very similarly to the way I do. And I found a, uh, a heaven there. At the time, I was uh, disenchanted with the Hollies. They did not seem willing to move from that set formula. They did not seem willing to uh, sing songs of deeper meaning. They wanted to do a Bob Dylan album and, and turn it into a kind of a Las Vegas uh, feel with horns and stuff, strings, which I was totally against. And at the same time, I'd been hanging out with David. Now, when you hang out with Crosby and you're smoking you know, vast amounts of the best dope that you can find, you know, you begin to change. And I was a very different person than the rest of the Hollies. And so it became evident to me, even before I'd sung with David and Stephen, that uh, I would have to deal with this and that I could not go through the rest of my life living like this and creating music like this. Crosby introduced me to Stephen. It was Cass Elliot from the Mamas and Papas who first introduced me to Crosby. So if anyone is to blame for this whole thing, she is. God bless her. She introduced me to David. David introduced me to Stephen. We sang together in either Joni's living room or Cassie's kitchen, and we were so high, no one can remember for sure exactly where it was. But at that moment of blending our voices together, I knew that I had found something that was totally unique, because you must remember each of us were harmony freaks. You know, we, uh, we were quite good at what we did. And when we heard that blend of our three particular voices, even though anybody else could sing the same notes. No one on earth sounded like that. And we realized together that we would have to make music together for the next few years. That's a great story. I'm interested in, in that message in the music that you're talking about. Um, and I'm going to go back on that just a little bit. Okay. If you could just tell me, as if you haven't even told me the story yet, that, that the music was too, the early music, while it was popular and fun and, and all those things, we're going to change tape. Okay. Um, so there I was with the Hollies, having done six years of making hits, as we discussed before, three minutes, perfect pop hits. I then start to hang out with David and Stephen. I start to expand my consciousness greatly. I began to become more aware of what's going on in the world and that it was not all uh, rosy colored glasses. The message in the music began to change drastically. We began to talk about what was happening to us as people, as artists, as performers, as viewers of the society within which we were operating. We began to talk about the Vietnam War. We began to flip out our record companies and our managers who said, wait a second, you know, 
come on, let's get happy again here. You know, no one's going to buy these records. You know, you're talking about deep stuff here. This is not going to sell. Well, we didn't care. Each of us, David and Stephen and I, David from the Birds, Stephen from the Buffalo Springfield, myself from the Hollies, had had several years of, of the other side of it, of just shallow pop music making, making, uh, making money and becoming popular. We decided that uh, from now on, we were going to talk about what we wanted to talk about. We were going to take our responsibility as troubadours very seriously and speak about things that were important to the kids today. We started with the uh, Vietnam War. <clears throat> we started uh, with Chicago. We started with uh, Watergate, with Nixon, with uh, Ohio, with the four kids killed. We started with uh, the, the environmental movement. We started uh, with whales. We started with the farm workers being starved and poisoned. We started with teaching your children a better way of living. We started to um, change the message of the music. And obviously we were not the first. That must go back to, <coughs> excuse me, and people like Woody Guthrie and, and Dylan. Uh, but afterwards, uh, many more people began to realize that, uh, that there was a message in the music and it was affecting the kids. The kids were eating it up. They were uh, loving it. They were listening. They were taking their destiny in their own hands. Excellent. Um, <coughs> would you like some coffee? Um, I'm fine. Okay. Um, if I take you back just a little bit towards <coughs> the middle of the 60s, before we get into uh, you know, Nixon and Watergate, Ohio, Kent State, uh, give me an idea in those later 60s what the what the values were you guys were talking about? Why why were what were the values and why was it important? And were the kids were the kids listening? Do you think the yeah. kids cared? Sure. The values that were uh, espoused at the time, I still feel are very true today. Love is better than hate. Cooperation is better than antagonism. Cooperation is better than than confrontation. L let everybody live and be treated as you would want to live and be treated. All those so-called hippie values that the kids glommed onto so, f so strongly are still true today. <clears throat> what we refer to as the, uh, the legacy of Woodstock, if you will. Uh, all those people that went there and experienced Woodstock, even if it was either being there, uh, playing there, being a part of the audience, or seeing it in the media, all those people are now the television directors, the film producers, the, the bankers, the, you know, the people that control, are in control now, and they carry with them those same hippie philosophies. And I believe that the fights that were started then in the 60s, the fight for racial equality, the fight for no more destruction of, uh, of human lives in war, the fight for uh, uh, equal representation, the fight for a better environment, the fight to uh, you know, feed and educate our children the best way we can. Those fights are now bearing fruit. George Bush may want to take credit for it all, but those fights were started by the children of the 60s. The Berlin Wall coming down, the release of Nelson Mandela, the uh, changing attitude of the South African government, the turmoil in Eastern Europe, those fights were started way back then and are only now just coming to fruition. Can you talk to me about, um, at that time, the, the change that started to happen? You talked about it personally, but for instance, were the, were, were the Rolling Stones different from the Beatles? Was there a different message? Was there a different image there? Were they culturally <coughs> I'm trying to get a sense of who some of these different groups were. Remember, we're talking to a lot of people who did not live through the 60s, right. like Lisa's age. The Rolling Stones were very different than the Beatles. The Beatles had their niche in life carved out. They were hard-edged boys next door, ac acceptable by parents, loved by parents in many, in many ways. Okay for your daughter to like them. Okay for your son to buy their records. Okay to listen to their music. 
after the Times uh, newspaper article uh, about the uh, Aeolian discords uh, in their music, uh, they became acceptable to, by the intelligentsia and sought out by them at parties. So that image was locked in by them. Now the Rolling Stones, who also wanted to be as popular as everybody did, realized that they could not they could not replace that niche that was carved out so strongly and so firmly by the Beatles. So they began to uh, take on the image of the people that you didn't want your daughter to go out with, the people that you didn't want your son to buy their records, the people that you uh, were horrified to see in, in the newspaper that they'd pulled into some garage somewhere in, in, in uh, north of London and urinated in the streets and been caught by the police. And those kind of things, the rebellious boy next door, the, the boys that you didn't want your kids to, to play with and to emulate, those were the Rolling Stones. Great, perfect description. Um, what do you think, what band in that era, and, and keep me in that time period, what band do you think best embodied what the 60s were all about? Was there one band you think that really... Sang? There were two bands, absolutely, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, and they covered both ends of the spectrum. Uh, the Rolling Stones covering the incredibly earthy, bluesy street vibe, and the Beatles covering, later in their music, the uh, 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 experimental... Uh, intelligent music, not to say that the Rolling Stones music was not intelligent, I, I personally thought it was, but uh, more cerebral, more uh, avant-garde, more experimental, as I say. So the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, to me, are the two bands that uh, definitely summed up what rock and roll music was about in the 60s in England. Uh, now, I want to talk to you about the idea of this message being carried by the music. Were, were the bands leading the message, Graham, or so that the kids would follow? Or were the kids given the cue to the artists? I don't believe so. I don't believe that the kids were giving the, uh, uh, the artists the cue. What was happening is, because of the tremendous amount of drugs used and the tremendous amount of introspection and self-examination and, uh, and looking inward at yourself and seeing what you were about, with those new eyes, you would look at the rest of the world and as a musician and as an artist, you would respond to that world, internalize it, and spew it out as uh, rock and roll music. So I don't believe that the kids gave us the, uh, the cues. I think our cues came from living, by waking up every single day and taking a deep breath, realizing you were alive and that you had to get on with something that was important. And uh, there were lots and lots of things that were being perpetrated on the people by the administrations and by the people that control the, the power and the purse strings that were not being told to the people. And what we did as artists uh, was to expose those, to bring sunlight and fresh air upon problems that had to be faced. And uh, that coupled with uh, growing up ourselves, it was a fascinating time for me. Just fascinating. Perfect. Uh, but responsibility, Graham. We're talking about a time that was 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 rife with with drugs, yes. with uh, sex. Yeah. Uh, as as a popular cultural hero of the time, did you feel a responsibility regarding those issues to these kids? These kids, that yes. you were leading. Absolutely, the responsibility was to uh, allow. Why you, I'm sorry. Why don't you start me off with I felt. Okay. It's. It's been an interesting uh, thing to think about these many years, especially in light of what's been happening to the drug business nowadays. But then uh, we attempted to allow kids to break out of Victorian thinking and the regimented thinking of their parents. Uh, that was an uh, overflow from the 50s. The way to do that, we thought then, was to expand your consciousness. The way to do that was popularly then uh, um, marijuana, hashish, and uh, LSD. And although I never personally told anyone to take it, I certainly did so myself. And by example, I'm sure other people did also. I think it was necessary then. In retrospect, I'm not quite sure that uh, we did such a great thing because 
it went from a friend of yours bringing a key from Mexico and splitting up grass amongst friends to Uzis in the street and blood all over the place. And uh, it's a very different business. Uh, consciousness is not expanded very much through crack or cocaine. It's a very different situation now. What was it like in those days? Did you feel that you were a leader of, of a movement? Did you feel like you were part of this youth culture in terms of the administration of it, in terms of the, you know, hey, we write stuff, these kids hear it, they grab onto it. What, the, what, the, what that must have felt like? In many ways, back then, it was a very powerful feeling. It was uh, very gratifying as an artist to uh, realize that people were listening to what you had to say and in many cases acting upon what you had to say. As an artist, my, uh, my thing is to communicate and to realize that I was communicating on such a, a large level. Now, you must understand this is only rock and roll. This is only music. This is only the youth culture. In the history of the planet and in the history of the galaxy, it's a blink, in, a blink of an eye. But being immersed in it, it was tremendously important that people listened to us and that we had the responsibility to analyze what we were saying and make sure that it was as truthful uh, as we could get it. And a perfect example is... Uh, Neil and David up in Northern California watching the news and seeing the four uh, students dead at Kent State. Crosby telling me that he saw Neil's face. He saw Neil go off into the woods. Neil came back an hour later and played in Ohio. Crosby called me and Stephen, who we were in Los Angeles at the time. He said, Neil has written this song. You're not going to believe it. We've got to get in the studio right away. Stephen and I booked the record plant here in Hollywood. Neil and David came down, we went into the studio, we cut Ohio, we cut the B-side, um, Find the Cost of Freedom. Ahmet Erdogan, who was the uh, president of Atlantic at that time, was at the s session. We gave him the master, he took it back to New York. That single was out on the street in 10 days. We killed our own single of Teacher Children, which was my song. And we didn't care. We didn't care about any of those rules. We didn't care about the record company saying, listen, you don't want to do this. Let Teach Your Children get up there, do its thing, and then, you know, a couple of months later, bring it out. What we wanted to do was bring it out instantly now. We were angry now. The kids were angry now. We wanted to speak and scream about this now. We wanted to put that record out on top of our other record, and we killed it stone dead, and we didn't care. Just for the sake of this... Uh explanation of this for people who don't know what was Ohio what was the message in Ohio? the message in Ohio was very simple when the American administration wanted to bomb Cambodia secretly and the, the news got out the students demonstrated at Kent State University against the uh, bombing of Cambodia the governor sent out the National Guard foolishly with live ammunition And the National Guardsmen opened fire on the students and killed four of them stone dead. And that f uh, photograph of the bleeding boy with the woman, the young girl, bent over him uh, must be in, in everyone's uh, consciousness that, that existed at that time or have seen that photograph since. We were killing our own children. And we were killing them in support of a secret policy of slaughter on a mass scale in Cambodia. And the youth were not going to take it. They gave their lives to protest it. And Kent State was the very essence of the youth movement for me, was the very essence of youth saying, this is wrong, I'm going to say something, even if I may die. And four of them did. And that was the story behind uh, Kent State. Perfect. Um, on a little bit lighter subject, and I'll take you back a little bit now. Um, hair. Something we're talking about here. We're talking about feel. Culture, style. When did you first... <coughs> did you like long hair? When did your first long hair first occur to you? I mean, we look at the Beatles now, we think it's laughable. How right. <coughs> I had, I've always had long hair. I've always been a pain in the ass to my mother and father on that score. Because as much as freedom as they gave me, you know, I did exist out there as a reflection of my family. And from the mid-50s, I loved long hair, and I've had long hair. 
you know. I don't know. It was just uh, I thought it looked better to myself and to the girls. I've always had long hair. I've always loved it. I've always loved what it stood for. I've always loved uh, the finger in the face of the establishment that it stood for. It was. It used to get tough, you know, because when you were a rock and roll band in the early 60s and in the mid 60s, when people didn't have the tolerance for hair that they have nowadays, uh, you would physically get approached and, you know, you know, called uh, gay or fags or queers or whatever it was, you know. You know, a lot of people did not understand long hair at all. They really, it was really a threat to them. It was really, uh, it really flew in the face of conventionalism. And long hair was a flag for someone. You could see somebody across the street, and if they had long hair, you knew how they thought. You knew that they were into good music. You knew that they were into... Uh, uh, a reasonable life, you knew that their thought processes, you knew that they probably hated the government, you knew that they probably knew where the best dr uh, drugs were, you knew that they, that it was someone that you could just nod to and have this understanding between. Anybody that had really short hair, you knew what short hair meant. Strange, isn't it? It is strange. Uh, I, I know you're the wrong person to ask about this, but you were intimately involved with it. Um, David's song about about almost cut my hair was 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 uh, an anthem for me. Yes, when I was a kid, and for many people. Um, what what was that song saying? Why was that message important? Why was that hair so symbolically important? Because it was uh, it was a flag, it was a symbol of rebellion, of a new way of thinking, of a tantalizing of your parents, a finger in the face of convention. And that's what it was. And when David almost cut his hair, he didn't say, I did. He said, I almost cut my hair. As a matter of fact, he tells a very wonderful story about uh, his time in, in, in Huntsville Jail in Texas and him playing with the prison band and him finding out through the grapevine in the prison that uh, the warden really didn't like that song. And so he would play it just to upset the warden. It really did take on an ominous tone, though. Yeah. Like hair became the issue for everybody. Yeah. It was an interesting uh, night that we cut that in San Francisco, and we had to get David a little drunk to sing that vocal. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. But, well, you know, we cling to our guitars like uh, shields, uh, you know, against the night. And uh, we got David to take off his guitar and just sing the hell out of that song that night. It was an, I remember it very fondly. Um, yeah, we'll change tape. We'll do two more tapes. Sure. You got the time? Yep. I need to go to the... Ah, you know, we, we have a, a lot so far in this program. We've talked to people about LSD, and we've talked about harder, some of the harder drugs, etc. But pot, we, interestingly enough, when I was screening the material, nobody really talks about pot and what it meant, why pot was important, and... On the other side of that, if you didn't smoke it, you kind of like weren't part of it. So. Right. Absolutely talk? true, yeah. Pot put you on the other side of anything. Meaning that if you were looking at a situation and you looked at it from this side and that was your mindset, after you smoked dope, you had the ability to remain on this side of it but also travel to the other side of the situation and look at it from a totally different perspective. It opened up for me uh, vast areas of new thinking. It broke me free uh, of, of a mindset that was not healthy, of a one-sided uh, viewpoint that was unhealthy. Uh, it allowed me to see around things rather than just at it. And it was a very valuable perspective to me, especially when I was uh, growing up and especially when I was making music. Um, it's strange that people don't talk about it too much, but uh, I found it to be extremely uh, useful to me. Did it signify membership in this particular club, this particular movement? What did it mean if you didn't smoke it? In many ways, it meant that you weren't a part of it. I was in a band where um, the other members didn't smoke it. 
And to me, they, they were unhip, not part of it, not uh, cognizant of the secret language, not a part of the brotherhood of, of dope smokers. And uh, that in itself is a dangerous situation, of course. But uh, that, that's the reality of it. You could always, if you, if you met someone and you knew that they smoked dope in those early days, you knew, once again, almost like looking at uh, the length of their hair, that uh, they were cognizant of, uh, of the things that you uh, were cognizant of, and that you didn't have, in many ways, to explain anything. So uh, we smoked a lot of dope. A lot of dope. Um. In those days, I guess what I need is a kind of summation from you. Imagine that we're, we're still in that time, if you would, uh, the late 60s and uh, early 70s at the, at the very latest. Um, were, there, were there seeds planted in those times that you could see at the time that you knew were good seeds? Yes, very much. And, and don't bring me into today if you can help right. me, but I knew at the time yeah. some of these messages. It was very obvious that some of the things that we were talking about, some of the values that we were uh, talking about, some of the ways of thinking, ways of looking, ways of behaving uh, were planted in the 60s. And they're, uh, they're very simple. And we talked about them before, brotherly love, letting people uh, live without oppression, uh, letting people live in equality, letting life take you instead of fighting it, letting uh, your fellow human beings live in dignity, uh, fulfilling the American dream. Those, those were the basic seeds that were planted in the 60s that, uh, that uh, I would like to really believe were planted by good farmers. Um, yet there were excesses, even then. There were yes, excesses. there's bad and good in everything. I mean, the 60s wasn't all uh, good and it wasn't all bad either. But there were things that were happening there that, uh, that were obviously uh, necessary for the flowering of the youth, for the growing up of the children, and uh, I was really, uh, and still am, very proud to have been a part of it. Yes, there were things done that, were, that maybe shouldn't have been done. Maybe we should not have espoused so much drug taking. Maybe we should have not have made it so uh, glorious, so, uh, so uh, enticing. Uh, there were mistakes made, absolutely. But as with any uh, uh, organism that grows up, there uh, is a process of discovery, of mistakes being made, of directions being found, and uh, so be it. Perfect. It's exactly uh, the statement I needed to get me to the end of that show. Um, I want to ask you about Teach Your Children, because uh, I know it's your song, and I think it, it kind of addresses what we were just talking about. Using that song as a metaphor, if you could, how does that song exemplify those values that, that, that the 60s were all about for you? Teach Your Children uh, that I wrote in uh, the end of 1969, beginning of 1970, to me was an attempt from someone that was coming out of World War II in England, and I was still alive when, when World War, I was not still alive, I was alive when, <laughs> when World War II was still going on. I was three when it finally uh, stopped in 1945. Seeing my family dealing with the aftermath of war, with rationing, with shortages of food, with shortages of goods, with uh, um, shortages of money, coming out of that period, I began to realize that if we did not teach our children to think differently, to uh, examine themselves differently, to explore differently, to behave differently, and then we were condemning ourselves to uh, a very gloomy future. At the same time, I realized that it was very possible, because I'd experienced it myself, 
to learn from your parents many great things. At the same time, I also realized that it was possible for them to learn things from me, from us, from the children. And so Teach Your Children is an attempt by me to explain to people that, yes, we have to change the way we're teaching our kids and feeding them, change what we're feeding them, change what we're teaching them, and that it is possible to look at our children and learn many great lessons ourselves. The first line of the song, you who are on the road, the road becomes a... Uh, it's a metaphor for life, mm -hmm. yes. You who are on the road, what a strange road it's been. It's a, the road becomes a, an, an integral part of this series, too, because what happens is a lot of young people hit the road, a lot of young people go on yeah, the road. Yeah, right. And uh, I think one of the reasons that song was so popular with some kids is that they identified immediately with that. Yeah, well, that's what happened with our band. People used to look at Crosby, Stills & Nash and Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young and realize that they were three or four human beings that were living the same life that they did. And when that happens, something strange happens. People begin to feel less lonely. They begin to feel that they're not crazy in the way they think. They begin to feel empowered. They begin to feel that they can take a hold of their destiny and march forward and grasp it. And that uh, s that is one of the things that I truly believe that people love about uh, this band of musicians. They see human beings up there. We don't have high heels, we don't have sequins, we don't have smoke bombs. All we have is uh, these bodies and songs. That's all we have. That's all we've ever had. That's all we've ever felt was important, was the music. We were talking about Jim Morrison in the bathroom. And uh, the, as the 60s came to a close in, in our show five concept, there was Morrison, Joplin, Hendrix, Mama Cass. These people were victims. Or by today's youth, by people who are not products of the 60s themselves, they look at these people as tragic figures, tragic lives. Um, yet the youth of the time held them up, said, hey, th these are our heroes before they died. These are our heroes. How do you reconcile that? Do you, how do you reconcile these lives, these artists especially? I knew all the people you just mentioned. If you, if you could tell me okay. this, because they won't hear my question. The death of, of personal friends uh, is very traumatic. It's such a fragile life. It's such a fragile line that we were walking. We knew later on in the 60s that the amount of drugs that were being taken was very detrimental to our health. Many of us stopped using. Many of us continued to use and used more. The death of Jimi Hendrix, of Brian Jones, of my friend, dear friend, Mama Cass, uh, who is probably the reason that I'm sitting here talking to you now, the death of Janis Joplin, uh, the death of Jim Morrison, of Tim Buckley, of, you know. It, it's, it shakes you to your core because there but for the grace of God go I. It's a very fragile life, and they lost the grasp of the silver thread that connected them to humanity. And... I don't see them as victims of society. I see them as victims of themselves. And uh, I'm very sad for them. I often wish that uh, they were not dead. I often wonder what contribution they'd be able to make to popular music today. Uh, but that goes with all, all the people that died, you know, Buddy Holly, who, who wasn't his fault, you know, Richie Valens, you know, Elvis to a, to a large degree, even though, you know, a lot of people say he died when he went into the army. The loss of personal friends is, is very traumatic for me. I feel very uh, fragile about it. I feel, I feel very, uh, it, it forces me to look in that mirror and to realize just what a slim hold most people have on life. But Greg, what did it say about this time? What did it say about this art? I mean, if you're a parent at that time and you're watching this stuff go on, you've got to be freaking out. You've got to be saying, what is it these people yep. are selling my children? Yeah, it's true. But in most chemical 
equations in most chemical experiments, when you force something to exist at a faster pace than it normally is, you've got to expect burnouts. You've got to expect uh, unavoidable situations. In music, in popular music in the 60s and even today, we are living at such an incredible fast pace that it's inevitable that people fall by the wayside. It's inevitable that uh, people uh, make mistakes and people go one step too far and lose it. And that's what happens. And what is the message? I'd rather concentrate on not the tragedy of the individual death, but on what those beings brought to the kids of today. I'd much sooner concentrate on that. And it, it kind of takes the edge off my sadness when I realize the tremendous amount of music that Hendrix brought into the world, the tremendous amount of music that Mama Cass and Janis Joplin and Brian Jones and, and Jim Morrison brought into the world. I'd sooner concentrate on that and uh, feel less sad. Um. <coughs> Woodstock, you were there. Uh, a lot of people watching this, most of the people watching this certainly weren't. Was Woodstock the beginning? Was it the end? Was it, was it real? Was it a symbol of what this generation could be? Or was it just a wild party with lots of drugs and sex? What was Woodstock? Woodstock was lots of things. Woodstock was the beginning of the, the uh, the kids in this country really realizing that they could for a number of days and therefore why not forever take their destiny in their own hands and have a good time and harm no one it was the end of uh, something in many ways it was very much co-opted by the media it was then the beginning of uh, it was the end of free concerts and the beginning of mass business in the music industry it was a wild party. It was a time of a lot of good music and a lot of horrible music. It was everything. Woodstock was the entire uh, flowering and birth of a new generation and the death of a couple of people. A couple of people got killed at Woodstock. Uh, it was all those things. Woodstock was a tremendously uh, pivotal event in the 60s. What was it like to be there? What did it mean? What, did, what was the feeling there? The, fe the there are, I have varied feelings about about uh, about Woodstock. We were in a hotel room in New York City, uh, hearing news reports about you know twenty five thousand people are going to turn up, or oh, fifty thousand people are going to turn up. Ooh, do you know a hundred thousand people are going to turn up? And it started to take on a myth of its own even before we'd played it. I was with Joni Mitchell at the time. We were uh, going out together, and. Uh, she was going to do the Dick Cavett show in New York, and Elliot Roberts, uh, our manager, decided that it, uh, because there were so many people going to Woodstock that maybe Joni would have a problem getting out, and so he advised her not to go to Woodstock, so she didn't go. And to be able to write such a beautiful song as Woodstock that Joni did, never having been there, is quite a remarkable achievement. Um, I have... Uh, waves of impressions of Woodstock are flying in the helicopter over these vast tribes of people with uh, fires and smoke and uh, setting sun, of mud, of rain, of tremendous friendship, of tremendous cooperation, of tremendous uh, working together of fellow musicians, of people not having equipment, of people saying, here, take all my equipment, of uh, standing on the side of the stage watching your heroes, watching your peers perform, of being the center of attention with all the people that we respected looking at us, of being good and brilliant in one time and being horribly out of tune in another time, of trying to get out of there as soon as possible. But when you stood on the stage and you looked out at all these people, <clears throat> what did it say to you about this youth movement? It made me very proud to be a part of it. I looked at those faces. I looked at the hope. I looked at the, uh, the, the tremendous amount of hope, that's the word, in their faces of a yearning for a free world, of a yearning for equality of brotherhood, of equality of races, of enjoyment of music, 
I saw those eyes and I was very proud to be a part of it. Even taking into consideration a lot of the bad things too. Um, everything, uh, let me just add, before, before we leave the subject all together, was there a particular song from this generation? And I ask everybody, I ask the Iowa couple this in, in uh, you know, uh, the ones who had kind of lost a son or had a son <coughs> estranged. Was there a song, what, what song do you think from that era best sums up or is most symbolic or embodies this? To me personally? I think the song that kind of sums it up for me uh, took place a little earlier in the decade. And it was, uh, I got a call from Paul McCartney one morning saying, uh, hey, we're going to do this thing at the EMI Studios. Do we want to come on down? So we went down to Abbey Road with a bunch of other people and watched them perform All You Need Is Love, being broadcast to millions of people throughout the world via satellite. I believe one of the very first mass communication events to have been there and to be a part of that and to witness that go down, that song to me uh, epitomizes what the 60s was about. It may be naive, it may be simple, but I truly believe that all you need is love. You're right, it was the first. First satellite broadcaster, a broadcast around the world. Um, I already know how you're going to answer this, so I'm going to prevent you from answering it the way I think you're going to do it. I'm going to say to you, when did... But I already know that you're going to do that, yeah, and so right. I'm going to so answer it. Right. Right. So when, when, <coughs> when did, I'm going to ask you when the 60s ended for you. And when I say that, what I mean is this period that we're calling the 60s, that extends from the 50s up into the 70s, 